Welcome to Turning Pages, a series of in-depth conversations with authors about their works. All right. Well, I am joined in studio by Michael Crummy, whose latest book is The Adversary. We talked when you did The Innocence, and uh, this is set in the same place and time. Yeah. At the time that you wrote The Innocence, was there the kernel of this idea for this book or... Not, well, no. Is that fair? I, I'm going to say no. Okay. Uh, I certainly had no plans to write anything connected to that book. Yeah. And I don't think of this as a sequel at all. Right. It's more of a, almost a mirror image of the last book. Um, so like most books, it does feel like uh, the the happening of it felt accidental almost, you know. Like I had, uh, when I was researching The Innocents, I discovered a particular historical figure who I was fascinated by. Um, he was a, uh, a fish merchant around the turn of the 19th century when The Innocence was set. Right. And just a complete reprobate, uh, a drunkard and a bully and a braggart. And, and more than that, like he shot and killed an Irish servant in an argument. Um, and the only uh, repercussion he suffered from that was uh, being made a justice of the peace a little later. Mm -hmm. And while he was justice of the peace, he recruited and imported a group of prostitutes from St. John's and set up his own brothel. And, uh, and I, I, I really was interested in trying to get him into the innocence early on. And then I realized it just had to, he was too big. Yeah. He was too far outside the cove where those where the brother and sister lived. Yeah. So I just dropped him. Um, but because the last book was called The Innocence, and it was total accident that it was called that. It was called a bunch of other things beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking a lot about Blake's Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, right? Which um, I think he describes it as uh, exploring the two contrary natures of the human soul. Right. That we all have the capacity for good and for yeah. evil. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was really interested in the way that... Uh, he wrote Songs of Innocence first, and when he wrote Songs of Experience, he just kind of flipped them on their heads. So he used a lot of the same setups, a lot of the same characters, sometimes the same titles, uh, but came at them from the complete opposite direction. And I started to think, I wonder, would it be possible to do something similar with a novel? So this historical figure that you discovered and then had to kind of like set aside when you're writing The Innocents, did he have a sister? No. And, or not that I'm aware of. Or at least not that, like, the widow. No. So I, so I had this notion of, uh, what I, of what I would do is I would start this new book exactly when The Innocent starts and have, have it run through the same length of time and as much as possible have all of the things that wash up on the beach in The Innocent's appear in this book as well. So the same uh, pandemics, the same storms, some of the same walk-on characters. Mm -hmm. And that really interested me as a writer. It felt like that was going to be a real challenge. And this character really interested me, but I couldn't get started. Like, I just, I didn't know what the story was. Because uh, this guy, just as, as a writer, he seemed like a dead end to me. Because... He was like a black hole, you know? He's a, I was like, okay, he's an asshole. Mm -hmm. What do I do with that? What is the story? And uh, at some point, it finally occurred to me, if this is a mirror image of the last book, then he has to have a sister. And as soon as I thought that, I felt like I had a book. It felt like there was a, a way of taking what was in the innocence kind of a twisted Adam and Eve story. And in this case, use the same sort of setup, but uh, have it be a Cain and Abel story. So, so was it, you needed like an oppositional force or a relational force or something that was both? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, in, it had to be oppositional in this case just because it was a mirror image of the last book, right? Where the relationship between the, between the brother and sister, which is very complicated and not always friendly, uh, but at its heart, it was a, a loving relationship. And that's what enabled them to survive all of the awful things they went through in that book. Um, the, uh, the historical character, 
Abe, who became Abe Strap in this yeah. book, seemed to me to embody the exact opposite of everything that was good in those kids. And, um, uh, and I wanted to explore what would happen if the brother-sister relationship in this case was not a loving one, but uh, an absolutely oppositional, and in fact, a hateful relationship. Yeah. And I was, in some ways, I think part of the reason that project appealed to me was because I was looking for an outlet, I think, for some of my own uh, sense of dread and anger and frustration about the way the world has been going the last eight years or so, 10 years. I think maybe forever, like but it does seem... 2016? Absolutely, a case in point. Um, and uh, and that, that Abe character did strike me in some ways as very similar to the former president of the United States in the sense that uh, his only relationships are transactional relationships. Like there is no, there is n Abe doesn't look at anything in the world except in terms of uh, what, it gets what can I get out of it yeah. and how does this make me look in the world? How does this make other people see me? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it does seem to me, and it's, it, the U.S., of course, was the big one in our own uh, public sphere, just because the U.S. US politics plays such a huge role in our own mm -hmm. sort of uh, ecosphere. Um, but it seemed to me that it was happening everywhere. You know, the guy in the Philippines, whose name I forget, who was going to assassinate drug dealers, Duterte, yeah. and Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm -hmm. the right-wing leaning government that just got voted out in Poland, uh, Hungary. I mean, you could just start listing them off, and it felt like they were just dropping. Mm -hmm. You know, in a lot of these cases, it was democracies where people got elected, and then they just started stripping away rights and presenting themselves as a strong man. And aligning themselves with the church, which in this case, you know, Strap does with Beetle. Yes, yeah. So, again, these types of people that I was interested in, uh, not only are their relationships with other people transactional, but their relationships with institutions are absolutely transactional. You know, so Trump, who uh, has never opened the Bible and has never attended a church service unless it was part of a political campaign, he is presenting himself as a, like a hero of the ev evangelical right. And they're taking him as such just because they know he will pay them back for their loyalty, right? Um, and so uh, everybody in this book, um, and the, his sister, the Widow Keynes, of course, is completely different in terms of how she operates in the world and in some ways in terms of what she feels is important, but uh, is just as interested in attaining and maintaining power and is just as willing to use everyone and everything around her to get it. Her, the big difference between them, of course, is that uh, Abe is like a bull in a china shop. And the widow is quite capable of making people feel like she has their best interests at heart as a way of uh, turning them into a tool that she can use in the world. It's a more, nor a more like craftier, manipulative yeah, approach. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't really have anyone in mind when I was writing her character. But, mm -hmm. I mean, if you wanted to think of who would that be in the world, I mean, like Putin operates, I think, or has in the past operated especially early on in his time, you know, as sort of like a friend of the West. And we, we recognize that the, the old days were bad days and we're going to be something different in the world. Clearly, he had Other very plans. different ideas. Yeah. But he knew how to get to the point where he could just slowly strip away all of those rights, uh, accrue all of the state's power to himself and most of the economic power as well. Yeah. And we see now what the, what the result of that is. You'd mentioned the Adam and Eve of the innocence, the Cain and Abel of this one, the, the, like, the biblical like, allegory. The adversary, the title itself, I mean, the adversary is mentioned as like the devil yeah. in, in you know, the book of Peter, in the book of John. 
Uh, yeah. Was 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 that the adversary you were thinking of? And you you mentioned you know that the innocence wasn't necessarily the original title. You you wrestled with it. Yeah. You know, could this have been called adversaries in the sense that you know Strap and the Widow? Like, or is it much more about like the the inherent the experiences side of Blake? The like yeah the evil that it, we all contain. Yeah. I mean, there was some talk about calling it the adversaries, mm -hmm. and I really didn't, I was not interested in that. Okay. Partly because there is something uh, much more powerful about this notion of a singular force that we are facing, or is that, or th is working against us. Right. Um, also because at this time, of course, which is the turn of the 19th century, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, uh, that was a time when uh, the notion of that evil character from the Bible was commonly referred to as the adversary. And that's certainly how the Beatle looks at the widow. Um, but in the end, I think, and there's the obvious op opposition between the brother and sister, and they see each other as as their singul singular adversary. Mm -hmm. But it feels to me like, you know, both of those characters were a challenge for me as a writer because uh, they don't change. Like, through the entire course of the they, book. They, they calcify, are, if anything. That's right. They become more who they are. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge for, uh, or I felt it was a challenge to, to figure out, well, how, how do you make a story with an arc out of that, uh, out of two characters like that? And in a lot of ways for me, what I was most interested in uh, were the characters around them and the ways in which they eventually became aligned with one or the other of them. Right. And, uh, and what that then meant for uh, their outlook in the world. And there were people who made conscious decisions like the Beatle who just sees Abe as the lesser of two evils and feels like this is one I can control or maneuver around or uh, used to my own purposes. And of course, there were tons of people when Trump got elected, for example, who said, oh, there will be adults in the room mm -hmm. and they'll curb his worse uh, excesses. And, um, and what they ended up finding out was you either bent to the will of whatever that was or you were booted to the curb, right? Mm -hmm. And then there were people who just seemed to fall into it, like sometimes with the best of intentions, or there were like absolute grifters who were like, I can get something out of this myself. And I don't care what this guy is or what he stands for. Uh, it, it'll work for me. Um, and then, of course, there are people like the, the young people who, the, who end up aligning themselves with the widow in this book who... Uh, again, are given the false impression that that this person has their best interests at heart. So, so the movement in the book for me really is all about the characters that are who find themselves locked in an orbit around these people. Well, you mentioned you know Strap being kind of a black hole for you, like th that's absolutely that's the like physics nature of a black hole that it sucks it, things right. in, right? And I think the widow. Is her I think own the black hole. Is her own black hole. So I always thought of this book as two black holes that are orbiting each other, mm -hmm. and eventually one swallows the other. The only question is which, which one. Right. And um, and so for the for the kind of secondary characters who, for me, are in many ways the heart of the book, the adversary for them ultimately is the thing inside them that they. Uh, that takes them into that orbit, right? And sometimes it's not even like w with uh, with Solemn and his sister. You know, it's it's their hatred of the man who killed their father that uh, aligns them with the widow, and it's their in inability to like look, look past the the hate that they have for this man to see the reality of the person that they're aligning themselves with. That is not to use any spoilers here but that but the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah kind of a yeah approach to absolutely things. yeah so i feel like and i think that's true of all the people i see around me in this day and age too right like we it feels like we're in uh 
a situation that is uh, where we're called to be on one side or the other of very big questions. Like, it's not just are you liberal or conservative anymore. It's like, are you on the side of uh, democracy or on the side of autocracy? And are you on the side of not completely destroying the ecosphere so that, you know, we actually have a, a planet to live in? Mm -hmm. Or are you on the side of just thinking, I'm just going to keep doing my job because that's what pays the bills? And, and it's very easy to, like, not address those questions and just keep your head down and so how about your business. conscious are you of addressing those questions within your writing as you're writing? Like, are you trying to be reflective of now in setting something in the 18th century? Yeah. Like, I mean, certainly in the innocence, it, was, it wasn't it was now so much that I was interested in uh, thinking of. But I, was, I wasn't thinking about the 18th century. I was thinking about the condition of childhood. And, uh, you know, I was thinking a lot about my own passage out of childhood into adolescence and how unbelievably uh, confusing and f terrifying and in many ways lonely that process was. Um, and because I'd found this story in the archives about this brother and sister, I was trying to imagine what it must have been like for them mm -hmm. at that time. So it, it was set in a very specific place and time, but for me it was about a condition of our shared humanity, which is... A universal and timeless a, thing. Yeah, yeah. And again, with this one, it was very much my personal, like the, th the personal hook for me was my own just thinking, we are in deep shit here. Like, things are really bad. And the people who are rising to the top seem to be people who are inviting us to be the worst versions of ourselves, right? Whether that's a political party during a provincial election saying nobody can tell which way you're voting in the voting booth, which, I mean, that's literally saying, listen, if you want to be racist, you don't you, have to be public about you it. You don't have to, yeah. But you can have a racist in government. But we got you. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my idea was I was going to take the worst of the world that we're in right now and shrink it down in some way and have those dynamics play out in this tiny community. So uh, it wasn't that I was trying to, I wasn't throwing in uh, like little um, cookies that people could find where they would say, oh, this is what's happening today. Right. But the dynamic, as much as I was able to um, make it feel uh, um, like it belonged in that time, uh, I was going to let that play out as as much as I possibly could. Yeah, I didn't know obviously that Abe Strap was built uh, based on a like actual historical figure because right. like he like you said he he murders someone and then is rewarded for it and it made me think of you know like Trump saying during the election like I could kill someone in the middle of Times Square and, and my poll numbers poll would numbers go up. Would go up. Yeah, and I think he's right about that. You know, and um, and so I had discovered Abe Strap. I'm. I think it was before Trump really came on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I could not escape the connection between the two. The biggest difference between the two men, like the historical figure and Trump, is that Trump is m much more of a coward. Like, he would never shoot someone mm -hmm. on any avenue, he anywhere. He would have someone shot. He would have someone shot. And, uh, but, you know, ultimately, I think he's an absolute coward. Right. And I think Abe is a little more reckless, you know, like, uh, I mean, I, th I don't know if Trump, he's not a drinker. He's clearly using something sometimes, <laughs> but I, I never in a way that would make him so reckless that he would do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's much more purposeful when he does something brazen yeah. rather than just like drunkenness. And I think that that's uh, one of the things I've always said about Abe, and I think this is a direct ripoff of my sense of Trump is that he has absolutely no skills except for his ability to to fuck with people. Like he has an innate awareness of how to mess with people's heads. And if someone upsets him, he knows how to get back at them. 
And if he wants to turn someone in a particular direction, uh, he has the ability to like use insults or threats or bullying to move them in that direction. And that's very much, I think, Trump's only real political skill. It's um, it's an like interesting counterpoint to the widow because her manipulations are like much more secretive and his are much more like obvious. Yes, but they're both effective in those manipulations. Yes. Yeah, and in some ways, um, in in some ways, the widow's manip- manipulations are more heartbreaking because the betrayal uh, is uh, is it blindsides people. Um, with Abe, nobody expects any better of him. Yeah. Um, but the widow is quite capable of uh, allowing people to feel like they love or admire her uh, and then to just knife them. Yeah. You'd mentioned not wanting to, like, do one-to-ones in terms of, like, what's happening now to, to what you set in the book. But, I mean, there's pandemics. There's the impact of climate on people's lives, and there is like economic upheaval. <laughs> is this just because, like, unfortunately, as a as a society, as like humans, this is something we go through, and right? Everything old is new again. Yeah, t- to a certain extent, that's true. Um, it's very uh, it's very peculiar because when I wrote The Innocence, of course, that was pre pre pandemic, mm-hmm. and there are a couple of instances in that book where a sickness comes into the cove. And when I was writing that book, I mean, that was a very uh, common thing that happened in those days before antibiotics, before penicillin or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But as a writer, I was introducing those things partly because I was writing a novel about two kids stuck in a cove by themselves. And I was just looking for something that would uh, change the, the sort of endless drudgery of their lives going through each season of the year. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, decided to make this book a mirror image, I had these pandemics that I had to introduce at the beginning of the book and then later in the book when it, it was like I was working with uh, an historical document that I was tied to. Um, But of course, my sense of what those pandemics were and how they affect a community was completely different because I was writing it post-pandemic. And um, so I I don't know, uh, I don't know if I had written this book and those pandemics hadn't been in The Innocence, I might still have thrown one in here. Right. Because it was such a, a huge part of all of our lives. And I think such a huge part of kind of the unraveling of our sense of a shared reality. You know, like I, th- I feel like a big part of the issue, and this comes up in the book a lot too, I think maybe in a subtler way, a huge part of the issue in the politics of the world today is, well, what is truth anyway? And who controls, uh, wh- who decides what is true and what isn't? And the pandemic was a huge turning point in that. You know, the anti-vax movement, all of that stuff, uh, tied in with all of the QAnon conspiracies from south of the border. So it feels like we're now living in a world where we're not just on different sides of political issues, but we're living in two different worlds in terms of our sense of what is real and what's not. What is a fact and what is not a fact. So, you know, you can't argue with a flat earther because facts don't matter to them. They have their own. They have their own alternative facts, their own experiments. All of them confirm this idea they have that the Earth is flat and that the notion that it's not flat is a conspiracy. So any evidence that you want to provide is just part of a massive conspiracy, and they just dismiss it. And I think anti-vax is the same, and all uh, all of the move to the right certainly in North America, I think is tied to that as well. Does setting this in a very small community where like, you know, mobility is limited, allow you to explore something like that in in like a hyper-focused fashion because like that's the kind of thing it could spread or that certainty or, you know, the the small mindedness because a certain, you know, authority figure says this is the truth? Right. I mean, it certainly makes it possible to to explore those issues through, through much smaller events, right? So we have... 
when when Abe shoots and kills the Irishman, for example, um, the Beatle immediately sets about creating a false narrative around that that exonerates uh, that exonerates him. And even though everybody else in town knows that's a lie, they're helpless um, to to fight the lie because it's the people in power who mm. are promoting it. So I think the way it's put in the book is they're forced to make room for it, right? They're forced to carry that around in one of their pockets. They're forced to set a, ta- a seat at their table for this lie. And it becomes a part of their life in a way that is demeaning and also uh, disempowering. And that makes them feel like they have less ability to have any say in their world at all. And that feels to me a lot like what I have experienced in in the world. But of course, the, the, the anti-vaxxers would say the same thing, right? They would just say that <coughs> our reality is the lie that they've been forced to live with, and that demeans and disempowers them. And it, so it sets us up in a world where we have two equally balanced or unbalanced ways of looking at the world, and there is no common ground between them. You know, like that reaching across the aisle thing they keep talking about. There's no aisle. There's no aisle anymore. Chasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it's pretty terrifying. You know, I don't know, and social media has had a huge role in that. But it does feel like um, it's possible to live your entire life in uh, a silo, where what you believe is never challenged. And is uh, sort of that echo chamber just reinforces it over and over and over again. And that's, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster, it seems like. It's interesting talking about the, you know, being forced to, like, make space for that lie. That Solemn's path really is, like, he be, he aligns himself with the widow because of that lie. Yeah. He, he chooses a side because it's almost, like, forced on him. Yes, and then it pushes them on a path that eventually leads to violence to reconcile with that lie. Yeah, yeah. And and not just to violence, but to violence that will ultimately destroy him. Yeah. You know? And um, and I think that that's, that's the... That feels like the path we're on at the moment. N- not to get too dark about it. Yeah. But it does feel like um, the the options available at the moment look pretty grim for all of us and that winning is just a different way of losing you know it's it will be just a different way of um ensuring nobody comes out of this in a good position so it was hard to write the book Mm -hmm. that way i mean part of what i've always done as a writer is i've tried to i mean my my books are not happy books (laughs) And then um, I, I'm never looking for an easy out. But I decided when I was when I started this book, if I was going to set up the dynamics that we have in the world today, and let it play out, that I was not going to interfere. I was not going to give myself an out or a reader, because generally what I'm trying to do is find the good in everybody. Even in the worst characters, I want to see where there's got to be some sliver of a real person in there. And even when the stories end badly, as they so often do, um, you know, like the end of Sweetland, which is a a story about a guy who uh, lives the last year of his life alone on an island and and dies there. Um, That ending to me feels somehow almost uplifting. You know, there is something about his... Uh, insistence on staying where he was from that felt really human to me Mm -hmm. but uh, I just knew that I couldn't allow myself to do that in this book because I wanted to see and to show where those dynamics lead if there's no intervention right if there isn't a third way and uh, yeah so a lot of (laughs) a lot of people have been like the response to the book has been really gratifying, you know, and a lot of people have talked about it being a book they loved, but 
almost all of them have said, have talked about how hard a read it is. And I totally get that, you know, and, uh, and apologize for <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but that was a deliberate thing on my part to just not ever say, oh, it's not so bad. Or, you know, at mm. least this person made it out. Um, I just wanted to let it go as far as it seems like it could go. If this plays out, this is how yeah. it plays out. Yeah. Uh, well, as much as it leads to, a, a, you know, some grim thoughts, I think it's been a great conversation and it's a very engaging read. Uh, the Adversary is out now. Michael Crummy, thanks for coming in and talking about it. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me again. It's good to see you.